the topic has been very timely and useful. Um, anything to do with migration mobility is quite important. Um, this conference has offered all of us the opportunity to passionately discuss migration issues, um, mobility as well. And very good papers have come out of this conference. I've sat in quite a number of the presentations and I find them very useful. The papers have ranged from migration and policy, migration health education, forced migration, migration across Africa, diaspora issues, migration as families left behind, um, determinants of migration, migration policy and governance. I think it's very important that whatever we do should connect with policy. And for that to happen, um, uh, the previous speaker mentioned that it has to be non-technical. That is why the issue about policy briefs, you know, very concise but very advanced statements have to be made. Uh, oftentimes the technical ones, uh, they don't find them appealing. And um, the terminology I, I tend to hear is that this is very academic. Uh, so we want to avoid being termed academic, but we we do the academic bits, but also be quite uh, relevant and useful. What can this conference or research offer for policy? One is for me to highlight the data limitations. Uh, most of the things we have done here, in one way or the other, has data limitations. We, for instance, talk about the, so far I've heard about migration affecting health, migration affect, you know, basically talking about the benefits. But migration is a double-edged sword. It has cost as well. What are the net benefits? What are the costs? What are the benefits? In the net benefits, is it positive, negative? Um, so far, I don't think we have had much information, much data to be able to estimate this and come out forcefully and say, yes, migration is beneficial. So oftentimes, you find some saying it is negative, some say it is positive, but because we have not had that much data or information. So it offers avenues for better data. It also offers policy makers the opportunity to consider funding research on migration um, so we're able to bring out informed uh, decision or make informed policy. The other Thing that is does or the research does is to highlight new areas for policy um, and there are quite a few that has come out of this conference that I can also uh, share. Um, the need for, for a migration policy to manage migration effect effectively. We don't have migration policy. Many of the countries do not have a migration policy. So if you don't have a policy, you cannot effectively harness the benefits of migration. I recall during the opening ceremony, the vice president mentioned that Ghana has a migration policy. It is true. And I was part of the architects that drafted that policy, of course, supported by the IOM. It was mainly uh, led or motivated by the IOM. Initially, government was not very forthcoming. Commitment was very low, but you need to get their buy-in. So I, I believe if other countries, the message you can take from here is for other countries to have a migration policy so we're able to effectively manage migration and minimize the cost or some of the issues with migration. Yes, you spoke about irregular migration. One of the other areas uh, research can offer to policy is, uh, as I mentioned, new areas to do with irregular migration and human rights. Um, there's a lot of irregular migration, and in Ghana in particular, research, our research have shown that they come from the Bronga Half region, uh, Techiman, Kuranza areas. Um, now, it is through research that we know that this is where they come from, and if there's a need to address irregular migration, then that is where the focus will be. It is interesting to know that the migrants that were deported from Libya close to 60% or more of them were from this part of the country, Bronga Hafu region. And I believe this information will help policy in addressing some of these um, 
negative effects of migration. There's also one area I don't think we have discussed very well in this conference, um, but it's the issue of trapped migrants, trapped migrants. Now with cyber fraud, a lot of people come to Ghana with the hope of investing in gold, in, with the hope of investing in other areas. They come, they lose huge sums of money. Um, I recall on a TV documentary uh, where the Ghana Police Service was showing some parcels or packages purported to be gold when they opened, they were cement blocks. You know, people who have been lured to come and buy gold. And they, they've lost, if borrowed money from their families, from other people, and have invested in this. Um, we have a student at the Center for Migration Studies who wrote her thesis, MPhil thesis on this. And I believe that is an area that is going to direct policy in terms of how do we deal with this new wave of crime, new wave of migration, to ensure that we get the most out of it. I can also add uh, the issue about internal migration and rapid urbanization. I think oftentimes we talk about international migration, remittances, but we tend to overlook internal migration. And that is a huge area that I think this forum can, can bring out. Um, people who move internally, uh, some with a hope of migrating internationally, but quite a number of them remain in our cities, uh, creating urbanization problems, growth of slums, um, and, and, and the host of others. So that is clearly an area for policy, which I think our research uh, should highlight. The, the, the research also highlights another gap, um, that is public education. I think we, the previous speaker spoke about irregular <coughs> migration. People migrate sometimes um, very ignorant about the challenges, very ignorant about the uh, cost, and, and the, the end up frustrated. I believe a documentary trying to tell people the right ways to migrate, proper migration. I recall there were a few TV documentaries, but it fizzled out on irregular migration, the challenges, and you know, so I think that's one area where um, this research or this conference should highlight and bring out. Migration and mining is something that was discussed, and, and I think uh, we can draw policy lessons from that. It can guide policy. Uh, we saw a presentation from Gordon on South-South migration and the rush for Ghana gold, the Ghana gold rush. I listened to this presentation quite in passionately. It was quite interesting the way we have foreign nationals and others from the sub-region mining gold. Um, it's, it's not a bad thing to have foreigners work in your country. We are all, we all in one way or the other, being migrants. But if, if it's guided by policy so that we enforce the policies and ensure that they are done the proper way, I, I believe that that will help. So this is an area I believe clearly that our research should focus on. And last but not the least is the global economic challenges and migration. Oftentimes when countries go through challenges, the first point of suspicion or blame is, is on the migrant. And, and that brings a lot of uneasy tension. And, and I think that's, that's an area that clearly uh, we should be highlighting. There's an increasing growth in what, what I term nationalism. Countries have now become very national in nature, given the global economic challenges. So yes, let's protect our own, let's protect our resources. And that, that's the need for policy to ensure that the problems of xenophobia and other things are highly uh, minimized. Lastly, um, government commitment to most of the things we are doing. We need to get government buy-in, and, and I believe through our research, we can, we can look at that. Before I hand over the microphone, I think I also identify some gaps, uh, one or two gaps um, that I want us to look at. We talk about remittances. Most of the time, remittances goes through, go through our banks, our financial institutions, people would withdraw them, and, and well, some invest. 
But to what extent can we offer better products, financial products, that when remittances come in, uh, they are invested, the financial institutions are able to harness some of these resources. And of course, the diaspora. How do we harness the diaspora, diaspora resources, uh, to ensure that we're able to get the maximum out of remittances? And finally, coping strategies and counseling opportunities for families left behind. I believe we've heard about postal babies uh, left behind, families, husbands, wives left behind. There are no counseling sessions, there are no nothing. I think they are just most of the time left on their own, uh, sometimes with the help of family members, but, but there's no clear mechanisms, clear information, uh, coping strategies that would help uh, such families to, to um, cope with the absence of a major player within the family. So I believe uh, there are a few others, but I would stop here, and I believe through the discussion we can highlight some of this. Thank you. Thank you.